lies. Well, I mean, intellectuals are very good at lying. They're professionals at it. In a wonderful technique. There's no way of responding to it. If somebody calls you, a, you know, an anti-Semite, what can you say? I'm not an anti-Semite. You know, somebody says you're, you're a racist, you're a Nazi or something. There's, you always lose. I mean, the person who throws the mud always wins. Yeah. Because there's no way of responding to such charges. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
night that we force people into identifying themselves by little tiny uh, because we oppress people we further oppress them by forcing them to, to identify themselves as what I consider less than human so if someone says I am proud to be black I go that's too bad for that guy because it's a retarded thing to be proud of white power. If someone says, I'm proud to be white, we see how ridiculous that sounds. But we don't see it when a person says, because they've been oppressed, I'm proud to be black. But it is ridiculous. We've pushed them into a corner where now they're going to spend their whole life identifying themselves by the pigment of their skin. Which is a sad waste of life. I'm proud to be gay, that's what I am, and that's how I'll live my life. Oh boy, you're really limiting yourself there, and it's too bad. And I know you've been forced into it by being pushed down and oppressed, but it's still very, very sad. And I don't think of myself as Canadian. And I think it's a terrible thing to say you're proud to be a Canadian or proud to be an American. All that stuff is nonsense. You may as well be proud to have lungs. You didn't accomplish nothing. You were born somewhere. Or, you know, you were just born with a, uh, a skin that's a certain color. Or born with a, a sexual attraction to a certain type of person. That stuff's all. things in life that are so unimportant and when people try to tell me that God is not important but that this nonsense is important I couldn't disagree more because there are certain things in society that you're not allowed to believe or speak on the brain. And so I'll just never say that. I'll just leave them in my brain. There are certain things in society that you're not allowed to believe or speak on the brain. And so I'll just never say that. Doesn't 
stand with the mob. The person who doesn't go along with the mob. The person who refuses to walk with the crowd. Will feel better. The person who doesn't stand with the mob. The person who doesn't go along with the mob. Will achieve more in their lives, whatever that is. Because they will have self-respect. I'm comfortable, as comfortable as you can be in the end times. As everything's burning down and there's plagues of locusts coming our way. And I have the satisfaction of knowing that I'm not lying. The problem with going along is that it demoralizes you. It makes you a smaller person inside. You will be demoralized because you'll know that you shouldn't have done that. And at some level, you will think badly of yourself for having done it. You'll feel regretful. You'll feel cowardly. And it will affect your life in other ways. And the opposite is also true. The person who doesn't stand with the mob, the person who doesn't go along with the mob, the person who refuses to walk with the crowd, will feel better. The person who doesn't stand with the mob, the person who doesn't go along with the mob, will achieve more in their lives, whatever that is, because they will have self-respect. That's what totalitarian movements across history always knew was that you grind people down and make them agree to lies because you will then be able to make them do anything. The Vaslav Havel, great late Czech leader, cites the example of a greengrocer in Prague in the communist era in Eastern Europe who has to put up in his window, like everyone else, the notice that says, workers of the world unite. And it's sent by party headquarters to all green growth. You all have to hang it. Vaslav Havel says a number of things happen to this. The first thing is that, of course, that the green grocer is showing to everyone that he is a party lawyer, so he wouldn't be able to operate as a business if he didn't do this thing. But it also hangs there every day as a sign of his subjugation. It's a little thing, but it hangs there as a sign of his subjugation. And it reminds him that he's not the man he could be. You think you're doing a little thing, but you're not are diminishing your soul by doing this. Because you know that you could be something more than the person who just has to hang whatever party headquarters tells you to hang this week. The person who doesn't stand with the mob, the person who doesn't go along with the mob, the person who refuses to walk with the crowd, will feel better. The person who doesn't stand with the mob, the person who doesn't go along with the mob,
somewhat exactly the world's most pleasant meditative experience. You can conjure that part of yourself up if you want, and that'll teach you something about what you're like. People don't do it because it's too frightening. But I know perfectly well that I could do that sort of thing. And so once I learned that I could do that sort of thing, and maybe that I could even enjoy it, I thought, okay, fine, I get it. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to live so that if that opportunity was presented to me, I wouldn't take it. It's my language. I'll take responsibility for what I say. Just 
disperse around you like they're not even there. these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says morning boys how's the water and the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes what the hell is water what the hell is water speeches, the deployment of didactic little parable-ish story. The story thing turns out to be one of the better, less bullshitty conventions of the genre. But if you're worried that I plan to present myself here as the wise older fish explaining what water is to you younger fish, please don't be. I am not the wise old fish. The point of the fish story is merely that the most obvious, important realities are often the ones that are hardest to see and talk about. Stated as an English sentence, of course, this is just a banal platitude. But the fact is that in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult existence, banal platitudes can have a life or death important. Or so I wish to suggest to you on this dry and lovely morning. What the hell is wrong? speeches like this is that I'm supposed to talk about your liberal arts education's meaning. To try to explain why the degree you're about to receive has actual human value instead of just a material payoff. So let's talk about the single most pervasive cliche in the commencement speech genre, which is that a liberal arts education is not so much about filling you up with knowledge as it is about, quote, teaching you how to think. 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 If you're like me as a student, you've never liked hearing this, and you tend to feel a bit insulted by the claim that you've needed anybody to teach you how to think. Since the fact that you even got admitted to a college this good seems like proof that you already know how to think. But 
I'm going to posit to you that the liberal arts cliche turns out not to be insulting at all. Because the really significant education in thinking that we're supposed to get in a place like this isn't really about the capacity to think, but rather about the choice of what to think about. If your total freedom of choice regarding what to think about seems too obvious to waste time discussing, I'd ask you to think about fish and water and to bracket for just a few minutes your skepticism about the value of the totally obvious.
So therefore, beware. Beware. Virtue. About 290 years after Christ, a Roman emperor named Diocletian took over. He really grabbed the bull by the horn. He took over in a period of turmoil and severe depression. The first thing Diocletian did was call in the gold and close the banks and raise the taxes. He reduced the power of the Senate, delegated its power to a lot of little government bureaus. Do you know they even had a transportation act back there? Prescribing the fee required to rent one laden ass per mile. And at today's rate of exchange, it would have amounted to about one-eighth mile, which meant that in order to make a profit, a jackass would have to carry five passengers, and were simply beyond the capacity of the jackass. Diocletian put millions of people on the public payroll, and this failed to do the job. The country was still in trouble. He asked more personal powers for himself. For a brief while, incidentally, they were standby powers, but then he used them all at once. He froze wages, he froze prices, he froze jobs, he stopped profits, he dictated to the farmer what he should plant, when and how he should sell it, and for how much, and he rationed food. And what happened? The labor market closed down, incentive was gone, farm life became dependent on bureaucratic red tape, exorbitant taxes cost the farmer his land, he kept for himself only a small plot on which he might grow turnips for his family, he lost the rest of it to the state. And without food and with incentive gone, city life stagnated and declined. And Rome passed into what history has recorded as the Dark Ages, lasting a thousand years. Lasting a thousand years. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. A nation would evolve from a monarchy into an oligarchy. From oligarchy to dictatorship, from dictatorship to bureaucracy, from bureaucracy to pure democracy, where finally the people would cry out from the chaos and confusion of the streets, oh please God, give us a king, and God would give them a king. And they'd have a monarchy again and start the whole silly cycle anew. Now either we will profit from the errors of their ways, or it follows us the night the day, our children are going to have to relive the dark ages. All over again. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. The world has gone in circles. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. 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 The world has the world has gone in circles. serious about this is like sort yourself out sort yourself sort out before yourself you out. try to figure out the world and yeah. that's that's the primary objective yep. that's your that's your most important thing that you can do yep, sort absolutely. yourself out sort yourself out and and marshal your arguments and put yourself in order so that when someone pushes you a little farther than you should go you can say no you can say no Here's some fundamental rules about the shadow that you might think about as you move forward through your life. So a lot of times you're going to have to negotiate on your own behalf. You 
should be able to stand up for yourself at least as well as you would stand up for someone that you care for. The problem with the idea of being nice to other people is that it doesn't take you into account. The fundamental rule is that you should certainly include yourself in the circle of people who deserve respect and care. And that means that you have to be willing to advocate for yourself. And if you're willing to advocate for yourself and you want to do it, you have to be able to say no. You have to, because otherwise you have to say yes, and then you can't negotiate. You can say no. to have armed yourself with strategies and plans that enable you to say no. You can't be dependent. You have to be willing to stand your ground. There's not much evidence that sorts of atrocities that characterized the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were the result of a few extremely corrupt people at the top of the hierarchy forcing everyone into slavery and then making them do terrible things. I think that's a very weak explanation. And when you look at human capacity for destructiveness, if you don't regard yourself as one of the agents of that destructiveness, or at least one of the potential agents, then, from the union perspective at least, there's a high probability that you're part of the problem. You can say no. You can say no. A little farther than you should go? You can say no. You can say no. If you familiarize yourself with the realm of human capability, and then you regard yourself as human, what that means is that you have to regard yourself as a creature that's capable of what human beings are capable of. And human beings are capable of a lot of things. Some of them are absolutely wonderful. I mean, there's nothing more remarkable than a human being on the planet. People can do amazing things, but the downside of that is that we can do absolutely horrible things. And it's not obvious that it's only the pathological people who do that. In fact, it's, that it's not reasonable to assume. That. You can say no. tell you things like follow your bliss and you'll your own counter utopia but that isn't what the unions especially Hume, said about his process of individuation at all he said that if you follow what's meaningful and you do it honestly it will take you somewhere you really do not want to go and until you go there you'll never be able to climb up higher on the other side
We have to create the culture. Don't, don't watch TV. Don't read magazines. Don't even listen to NPR. Create your own road show. The nexus of space and time where you are now is the most immediate sector of your universe. And if you're worrying about Michael Jackson or Bill Clinton or somebody else, then you are disempowered. You're giving it all away to icons. Icons which are maintained by an electronic media so that you want to dress like X or have lips like Y. This is shit brain, this kind of thinking. That, 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 that is all cultural diversion. And what is real is you and your friends and your association, your, your highs, your orgasms, your hopes, your plans, your fears. And we're told, no, we're unimportant. We're peripheral. Get a degree, get a job, get a this, get a that, and then you're a player. You don't even want to play in that game. You want to reclaim your mind and get it out of the hands of the cultural engineers who want to turn you into a half-baked moron consuming all this trash that's being manufactured out of the bones of a dying world. Where is that at? Where is that at? Where is that? Catalyst to say what has never been said. To see what has never been seen. To draw, paint, sing, sculpt, dance, and that. What has never before been done. To say what has never been said. To see what has never been seen. To draw, paint, sing, sculpt, dance, and that. What has never before been done. of conditions, geography, and history. And history. One, must One must realize that the moral order is in flux, is changing. There is no God-given right, wrong, true, false, moral, immoral. And with that kind of relativism, one is free, One is free. to live as a human being. One is free. One is free. One is free. One is free to live as a human being, not simply as a robot repeating patterns that have been enforced in the past. the past. So 
we have a much more sophisticated idea. Toward the social order. However, when it comes to this other problem of the natural order, one's nature as man, the thing is not quite so relativistic. One is free. One is free. One is free. One is free to live as a human being. One is free. One is free. One is free. One is free to live as a human being. One is free. One is free to live as a human being. One is free. as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. What has meaning? And what doesn't? What has meaning? And what doesn't? You get the conscious with the side. What has meaning? 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 The whole trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak. power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud. Always 
was on the verge of being found out. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful. It is that they are unconscious. They are default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into. Day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. And the so-called real world will not discourage you from operating on your default settings. Because the so-called real world of men and money and power comes merrily along on the fuel of fear and anger and frustration and craving and the worship of self. Our own present culture has harnessed these forces in ways that have yielded extraordinary wealth and comfort and personal freedom. The freedom all to be lords of our own tiny skull-sized kingdoms. Alone at the center of all creation. This kind of freedom has much to recommend it. But of course, there are all different kinds of freedom. And the kind that is most precious, you will not hear much talked about much in the great outside world of wanting and achieving and displaying. The really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and being able truly to care about other people and to sacrifice for them over and over in myriad, heady little unsexy ways every day. That is real freedom. That is being educated and understanding how to think. The alternative is unconsciousness, the default setting, the rat race, the constant gnawing sense of having had and lost some infinite thing. I know that this stuff probably doesn't sound fun and breezy or grandly inspirational the way a commencement speech is supposed to sound. What it is, as far as I can see, is the capital T truth with a whole lot of rhetorical niceties stripped away. You are, of course, free to think of it whatever you wish. But please don't just dismiss it as some finger-wagging Dr. Laura sermon. None of this stuff is really about morality or religion or dogma or big fancy questions of life after death. The capital T truth is about life before death. It is about the real value of a real education which has almost nothing to do with knowledge and everything to do with simple awareness. Awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us all the time, that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is water. This is water. This is water. water. This is water. This is water. This is water. It is unimaginably hard to do this. To stay conscious and alive in the adult world. Day in and day out. Which means yet another grand cliche turns out to be true. Your education really is the job of a lifetime. And it commences now. What has meaning? And what doesn't? What has meaning? And what doesn't? You get the conscious with the side. What has meaning? What has meaning?
thousands of years of experiment, our new nation has come so far, so fast. All, all, all this in less than 200 years. What is the secret of our success? Well, I think it had to do with a basic American's creed. Perhaps it never passed the pioneer's lips in this form, but if it had, I think he would have said something like this. I believe in my God, in my country, and in myself. I believe in my God, in my country, and in myself. I know that sounds like a trite, too simple thing to say, and yet it's a rare man today who will dare to stand up and say, I believe in my God, and my country, and in myself, and in that order. When the early American pioneer first turned his eyes toward the West, there were only Indian trails or traces, as they were called, for him to follow through the wilderness. Do you know today you can roller skate from Miami to Seattle, from San Diego to Plymouth Rock? In this little bitty instant, as historical time has measured, our 7% of the Earth's population has come to possess more than half of all the world's good things. How come? Well, sir, when that early pioneer turned his eyes toward the West, he didn't demand that somebody else look after him. He didn't demand a free education. He didn't demand a guaranteed rocking chair at eventide. He didn't demand that somebody else take care of him if he got ill or got old. There was an old-fashioned philosophy in those days that a man was supposed to provide for his own and for his own future. He didn't demand a maximum amount of money for a minimum amount of work. Nor did he expect pay for no work at all. Come to think of it, he didn't demand anything. That hard-handed pioneer just looked out there at the rolling plains, stretching away to the tall green mountains, and then lifted his eyes to the blue skies and said, Thank you, God. Now I can take it from here. Thank you, God. Now I can take it from here. That spirit isn't dead in our country, it's dormant. It's been discredited in some circles, driven underground, but it isn't dead. It's just that a few seasons ago, politicians baiting their hooks with free barbecue and trading a Ponzi promise for boats began telling us, we don't want opportunity anymore, we want security. We don't want opportunity, we want security. We don't want opportunity, we want security. They said it so often, we came to believe them, we want security. They gave us chains, and we were secure. Suddenly, with our constitutional guarantees depleted, with our national character eroding away, with our tax laws penalizing those who dare to prosper, with workers concentrating on how little they can get by with instead of how much they can produce, suddenly we looked overhead one day to discover that the first tin moon in space was a Russian accomplishment. That free men dragging their feet had been outdistanced by slave workers dragging their chains. And we were sore afraid. Perhaps this was a disguised blessing too. Maybe a dramatic accomplishment by this Cold War adversary was necessary to get us off our dead centers and back to work again. If we can revive in ourselves, then in our youth, something of that basic American's creed, the horizon has never, ever been so limitless. For man stands now on the threshold of his highest adventure of all, his first faltering footsteps into space. Twenty years from today, half of the products you will be using in your everyday living aren't even in the dictionary. We've got it made. If we just keep on keeping on. We've got it made. And if we don't, we will follow those other great nation states of history to the graveyard of ignominious oblivion. History promises only this for certain. We will get exactly what we deserve. God, now I can take it from here.
just what is it that you want to do? We want to be free. We want to be free to, to do what we want to do. We want to be free to ride. We want to be free to ride our machines without being hassled by the man. And we want to get loaded. And we want to have a good time. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a good time. We're going to have a party. I'm sorry. But I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone. The good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls. It has barricaded the world with hate. It has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical. Our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men. Cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world. Millions of despairing men, women and little children. Victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, or what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men, with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate. The unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery. Fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke it is written, the kingdom of God is within man. Not one man, nor a group of men. But in all men, in you, you the people have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You the people have the power to make this life free and beautiful. To make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power.
my goal is like try to do useful things, try to maximize the probability the future is good, make the future exciting, something you look forward to. You know, with Tesla, we like try to make things that people love. How many things can you buy that you really love? That really give you joy? So rare, so rare. I wish there were more things. That's what we're trying to do. Just make things that somebody loves. Like, what are the set of things that can be done to make the future better? You know, I think that a future where we are a space-faring civilization out there among the stars, that's what we should strive for. Out there among the stars, this is very exciting. Out there among the stars, that's what we should strive for. This makes me look forward to the future. It makes me want that future. You know, the things, there need to be things that make you look forward to waking up in the morning. You wake up in the morning, you look forward to the day, forward to the future. In a future where we are a space-faring civilization and out there among the stars, I think that's very exciting. That is a thing we want. Whereas if, if you knew we would not be a space-faring civilization but forever confined to Earth, this would not be a good future. That would be very sad, I think. No, I just think like, there, if there are two futures, and one future is we're out there among the stars, and the things we read about and see in science fiction movies, the good ones, are true. We have these starships, and we're, we're going to see what other planets are like. And we're a multi-planet species, and the scope and scale of consciousness has expanded across many civilizations and many planets and many star systems. This is a great future. This is a wonderful thing to me. And that's what we should strive for. Out there among the stars, that's what we should strive for. Out there among the stars, this is very exciting. Out there among the stars, that's what we should strive for. This makes me look forward to the future. It makes me want that future. Life has to be more than about solving problems. If all that life is about is solving problems, why bother getting up in the morning? There have to be things that make you proud to be a member of humanity. Only a handful of people went to the moon. And yet, we all went to the moon. We went with them vicariously. We shared in that adventure. I don't think anyone would say that that was a bad idea. That was great. We need more of those things. Out there among the stars, that's what we should strive for. Out there among the stars, this is very exciting. Out there among the stars, that's what we should strive for. This makes me look forward to the future. It makes me want that future.
Because music is everything. everything.